Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Youth Cloud Beast Jenkins Enterprise to scale Jenkins within AWS with guest speaker Adrian Waters, Solutions Architect at CloudBees. This webinar is hosted by East Energy Solutions. We specialize in open source and cloud recruitment and help organizations to build great technical teams. Now, just for some housekeeping, if you have any questions for Adrian, please fire them over via the questions box and he will answer them at the end of his talk. Please note this session is being recorded and we will send out a copy to you by email tomorrow. Now I'm going to hand over to Adrian to begin his talk. Thank you all for joining. Hello. Can, uh, can you hear me, Adele? Yes, okay, I've got a message that you can hear me, so that's, that, that's always good, and hopefully everybody can see uh, my screen um, presenting. So as uh, Adele has, has mentioned, my name's Adrian, and I'm a solutions architect at um, CloudBees, and uh, I'm looking forward to basically telling you a bit about CloudBees Jenkins Enterprise, um, um, particularly in relation to AWS, um, over about the next 45 minutes, and uh, so I hope that you find the session informative and, uh, and useful. So, just to have a quick look at what we're going to be um, covering. Um, I'll start with some introductions, or an introduction. Um, whilst Jenkins is extremely well known in the market, um, CloudBees may be uh, new to many of you. So, I'll, I'll start by giving a brief overview of, of who we are and, uh, in effect, why that qualifies us to you know, be presenting uh, on this, this topic today and, and delivering the products that we do. Um, we'll then have a look at a bit of background into some typical scenarios experienced by enterprises, uh, enterprises when they try to or attempt to scale um, Jenkins. Uh, and that will give context um, into the sort of later discussions where I'll sort of dive deeper into um, CloudBeast Jenkins Enterprise. Um, I'll use the acronym CJE um, rather than keeping on saying CloudBeast Jenkins Enterprise, so they are, they are one and the same. Um, so we'll be looking at its architecture um, and uh, the features and the context of how those they help you to scale, um, you know, as well as uh, going on to describe uh, an example of how you could deploy uh, into AWS. This is going to be by no means a, a deep dive across all aspects of CGE. I'm just going to be looking at you know areas that uh, relate to um, scaling a solution. Um, I'll then uh, take my life in my hands and uh, present a, a live demonstration. Um, as with live demonstrations, things can go wrong, but hopefully it will all, all work out smoothly today. Uh, and then we'll wrap up with some um, uh, questions. Uh, I'll also be um, putting my contact details up on the final slide. So um, if you think of anything after the event, then um, please do drop me a line and, uh, and get in touch. Um, throughout the presentation, I am having to make a few assumptions about um, your backgrounds and knowledge. So I'm assuming that everybody um, will have some awareness of Jenkins as an open source um, uh, product. And uh, also sort of familiarity with some of the other technologies that we're touching today, which includes sort of AWS and uh, containerization. Um, if you don't know those in detail, then fine, there's still going to be value in, in the presentation, um, but some of the, 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 the deeper detail may, may be lost on you. So just before introducing CloudBees, just a bit more about me. Um, say I'm a, a solution architect, so advising and demonstrating to enterprises how they can implement sort of robust and scalable Jenkins platforms, um, uh, particularly these days to satisfy the requirements of sort of uh, DevOps initiatives as sort of companies move into, into that sort of space. Um, I've worked in the software industry for many, many years, um, most recently within the uh, software configuration management um, space. I'm um, also working on the analytics side of things with, with vendors. Um, but I've also spent many years on the other side of the fence, um, uh, in effect, involved in all aspects of the development of sort of large-scale and mission-critical um, solutions. 
and uh, have been used in sort of automation and what I say are DevOps principles uh, for many, many years, long before uh, they came to the fore, um, you know, as, as we know them today. So just talking about um, cloud bees, what is our purpose? Well, we, we aim to solve the problems that enterprises will face or are likely to face when they attempt to scale um, Jenkins. Um, Jenkins isn't a typical open source um, project, um, but what it does share with other, uh, other sort of uh, open source tools is that uh, it's not really got sort of core capabilities that many larger organizations will require as their systems become more and more mission critical um, to business continuity. So typically, as, as usage grows, enterprises are um, you know, looking for a reliable source of information and sort of expert technical assistance uh, when you know, internal teams uh, run out of, uh, out of options. And if you're banking your business on this software running, then you don't want to be you know, relying on Google to you know, find out, well, what, what's the issue when you know, something has gone wrong? And as you scale, um, uh, solutions then security and access control become far more important. Um, you need to sort of uh, adopt compliance and be able to audit against compliance and, and you know, provide traceability. And as usage grows, you get more and more um, teams or individuals you know, joining um, the platform. Um, and you do get sort of scalability issues in terms of performance, this conflicting requirements. Uh, and it's not really what Jenkins was originally designed for, in effect, to scale across the, uh, the, you know, the large enterprises. So we sort of add uh, capabilities that sort of help in, in that respect. And then from a, a sort of a, a management point of view, um, where you have sort of uh, very complex pipelines and multiple user groups and projects, um, the, you, you end up with what we would tend to call sprawl, um, and uh, managing that, you know, is becomes more and more important, but more and more difficult to do. So we provide sort of analytics and um, uh, man, uh, management dashboards that allow you to look across your complete installation um, to sort of help uh, manage this sort of larger deployments. If we look back in history, um, Jenkins was first developed, um, it, it was known as Hudson at the time, and it was de developed by uh, an engineer in Sun Microsoft called Koshake. Um, and he built it for his own use as, a, as an automation tool for building and testing. Um, but uh, others saw it, they liked it, and it rapidly was rapidly adopted and sort of uh, fairly quickly um, organically grew uh, and was made open source, uh, I think some, somewhere around 2005. And uh, later, um, after Sun was acquired by Oracle, uh, the project was was in effect forked um, from Hudson to create Jenkins that you know has continued on through today. So Cloudbees, we know Jenkins um, inside out because Koshike, the original uh, developer and founder of, of Jenkins, is our our CTO. Another sort of fact that isn't well known in the, um, you know, in the market is that we are committed to, to open source and as well as having our commercial offerings, which we're going to be talking about today, um, we also heavily involved in the open source community and our engineers um, make, as the slide says, uh, about 80% of the, the, the overall commits into the, the community. So within, um, within CloudBees, we sort of wear two hats to some extent. One is looking at the open source um, side of things, and the second is the, the, the commercial um, products. And to CloudBees, it's essential that the open source product remains you know, relevant, current, um, has you know, the features that the market needs, because if, if core Jenkins isn't relevant, then whatever we do on top of that is also not going to be uh, relevant. So within CloudBees, um, Kosuke has a, a, has a team of engineers um, that are, are dedicated to um, you know, uh, enhancing and moving forward the, the open source product. 
And if we look back just over the last few years, some of the major initiatives that, that Cloud Bees have driven, um, you may you may be familiar with these. Um, uh, Docker, it was uh, clear a few years ago that uh, the Docker train was coming down the track and uh, that it was going to be an important tool in the, uh, the complete software life, si uh, life cycle. So CloudBees developed the initial set of uh, Docker plugins to ensure that the capabilities offered were available to uh, the Jenkins um, community. And this encompassed not just the um, initial sort of build and testing aspects, so allowing developers to uh, compile their code within Docker and do their initial unit testing within Docker, but also to extend it you know, further down the pipeline uh, with the ability to create Docker um, images uh, as your deliverables and potentially to sort of push those out um, into deployment. In order to uh, support the full software development life, uh, life cycle, Pipeline as Code was also a critical development that uh, CloudBees um, uh, drove into the open source um, product. This sort of uh, extends really the, the, the scope of what Jenkins was being used for, uh, for and we'll see a little bit more of that as, as we go on, um, but it's absolutely key to the ongoing um, you know, success and use of uh, of, of Jenkins as organizations adopt uh, their sort of DevOps, um, uh, DevOps uh, practices. And associated with the pipeline as code is, is a, a more recent addition to Clarative Pipeline. So this went into general availability, I think it was February. Um, and the aim of this was to simplify the syntax for creating and maintaining pipelines. So historically, core users of, of Jenkins were developers. And so they may well have the skills to script these complex pipelines. But the very fact that with pipelines, we're moving into a broader audience. And whilst you've still got developers at the left-hand side of that, towards the right-hand side, you've got sort of, you know, more people involved in testing, release managers, and so on, who may not have that sort of same level of programming skill. So the declarative pipeline aims to address that by creating a sort of a much simplified syntax and a much cleaner syntax to allow you to create and uh, develop, uh, sorry, uh, and maintain pipelines. And we'll see uh, a few examples of this as we get to the, uh, the demonstration. And then finally, Blue Ocean. Um, it's been around in beta form um, probably for about six months, um, but was initially released into uh, GA um, about two months ago, and there was a, a subsequent release last week. And this is a totally new and modern user experience um, for creating, visualizing, and maintaining the pipelines. So it doesn't replace the user interface that you, um, you already know within Jenkins. It adds on top of that. So the both, both can coexist with each other. Uh, and again, I'll be showing Blue Ocean um, later on uh, in the, the demonstration. But again, it's all part of this sort of drive to make Jenkins absolutely relevant to the full um, uh, continuous integration, continuous delivery pipeline. Because again, as you move right along the pipelines, the users become less technical. Uh, and whilst there's sort of, uh, you, you can find out lots of information in the existing user interface, this provides a sort of a much, much sort of cleaner interface to, to view your pipelines and progress. So let's look at uh, why we need to scale. What, what, is, what is the point of um, scaling and, and look at some of the challenges that, uh, that it pre, uh, presents. So say, uh, looking back again at the history, um, Jenkins uh, was originally developed in the, uh, say around 2004, 2005. Um, so it's now 12 to 13 years old. And if you were to look at, um, you know, any the other software products that uh, I can probably think of, uh, after 12 to 13 years, their popularity is starting to wane. You know, new products have come along, they, they may sort of uh, have better functionality, sexier user interfaces or whatever. Uh, but with Jenkins, the opposite is true. Um, its popularity is, is still increasing and it's actually increasing at a faster rate than it has um, in the past. So at the moment, um, I think this slide is slightly out of date. Um, it sort of shows about 120,000 active installations 
um, supporting around 7 million Jenkins jobs. Um, but those figures only represent the servers that are known about, that are reporting home, if you like. Uh, and it is highly likely that there will be you know, fairly significant numbers that aren't included in, in this. And the 78% figure on the right, that comes from a survey by um, an organization called InfoQ, um, which showed Jenkins being by far the most prominent solution um, in, this, in this space. So the popularity is growing, the installations are growing, so where are these installations happening? So some of them will be within new organizations, but, but many will be broadening the use within um, uh, existing or companies that already use um, Jenkins. So they're, they're taking on more and more activities, getting more users involved. So that is one aspect of why we need to look at scaling. So originally Jenkins was developed uh, for the purpose of being a continuous integration tool. And uh, probably in no way could it have been envisaged that it would have taken off as, as it has. So one of the reasons it became popular was uh, the ability to integrate with um, a wide range of products using the, the concept of plugins. Um, back in those days, if you were using any of the common build or test tools, the likelihood was that a, a plugin would exist. Or if it didn't, um, Jenkins provided the mechanism for um, third party vendors or, or other interested parties to develop a plugin. Uh, and hence the growth of this sort of overall uh, ecosystem that we have today. Then over the last few years, there's been a general market drive towards sort of agile and DevOps practices, um, and that's brought new requirements. Um, organizations undertaking DevOps transformations generally state their prime motivation as being time to market, so speed, speed of delivery. Um, other aspects that come into play, quality and cost and so on, um, but speed is normally the main driver. And so in order to achieve speed through your full pipeline, what, what do you need? Well, you need automation. So um, uh, you need to remove manual, uh, manual processes and delays that, that occur across the full life cycle um, to deliver that speed. And Jenkins is excellent at automation. That's what it was designed for. So um, it, it absolutely fits into the, um, into the area that or into a solution that can provide the same sort of functionality across the full uh, pipeline. So particularly if organizations have already been using Jenkins, then to some extent it's a no-brainer um, to use uh, Jenkins to then provide the orchestration across the complete CD pipeline. Um, why, why have one automation tool going ha doing half the job and another um, uh, finishing it off? So as this has sort of happened, uh, to some extent, fairly organically, more and more plugins have been developed to satisfy the requirements um, you know, towards the deployment end. And, uh, and that has brought new users on. Um, and as mentioned earlier, the number of Jenkins installations is still increasing. Um, but we are seeing it covering a broader range of, uh, of functions. So one item to take away just from this slide is the number of plugins now available. Um, from the open source community. So this provides you know, fantastic integration capabilities um, that no other product can compete with. None of this comes close. But it also presents a huge challenge that we'll be talking about as we go through the, uh, the, the presentation. So as we start to look at scaling, the extended use of Jenkins into continu continuous delivery domain is probably the most significant factor behind its ever increasing popularity. Um, and, and that has a side effect that it has become more and more crit mission critical to organizations. So if Jenkins is down, then the delivery pipeline stops and that's not a place that organizations want to be. So if we look at um, typically how Jenkins um, does um, you know, get deployed within organizations and how it, how it grows over time, we see two, two different sort of models and, and there's a sort of a hybrid in between. And the first of those is what we tend to call the monolithic master. And uh, it, it's 
started out some some point in history that uh, you know a single team or even a developer um, wanted an automation tool. They downloaded Jenkins and they started to use it on their laptop or on a, a machine under their desk. Um, they saw great results from it. Their colleagues saw what it was doing and and they wanted to come on board. So they started sharing the machine, uh, putting their own jobs onto the server, and uh, it continued to grow. And at some point, um, you know. It was deemed that, yeah, it's probably not the best place to be under the desk, so we'll, we'll move it into the data center. And, uh, you know, along, along with that comes some sort of element of, of central management. Um, and its use continued to expand uh, and grow as more and more users and teams came on board. But that has a consequence that, um, you know, you're starting to put uh, performance hits onto, onto the server, so it becomes slower. Um, you find that different teams have different requirements, so you know, different um, different needs, different plugins, um, or worse, they may require the same plugins but different versions of those plugins. So maintenance becomes tedious and it becomes hard. Um, managing the plugins, you know, become can become a real real problem, and in effect, this server becomes a single point of failure. And again, if you're, you know, certainly if you're um, you know, involved in the, the, the full uh, CI CD pipeline, you don't want a single point of failure. The other consequence there is the fear of upgrading. You know, it becomes very fragile. Um, the bigger a server comes, the longer it takes to restart. So even, you know, up upgrading, you know, may take the server out of action for tens of minutes or, or even hours for very large um, servers. And, you know, that isn't acceptable in sort of many, uh, many scenarios. So, Gradually, as it grows, uh, performance decreases, um, dissatisfaction uh, sort of in increases, um, and ultimately, you, know, you end up with un unhappy users. The second uh, scenario we see, um, you know, starts off in the same way, um, is that uh, your initial sort of developer you know, gets the server and they make great use of it, and then another team sees that. Um, but rather than piggybacking on on that first server, they download their own. And then a third team does, and then a fourth team does, uh, and that sort of process um, continues. So that's great in one in one sense, in that each team is working totally independently of the others. So there's no degradation of performance. Um, in effect, they're, they're they're sort of standalone. But that comes with its own challenges. You now have sort of many many servers um, uh, spread around the organisation, uh, no centralised control, no management. Uh, upgrading of plugins on, on, on all of these masters becomes onerous um, and, and difficult to, to manage. Uh, you might be able to carry out a build on one server, but it won't work on another because that server is configured differently. And there's no sharing of best practice you know, at, a, at a, sort of a technical level. And most importantly is the cost associated with it. So there's a lot of duplicated effort, there's a lot of duplicated uh, IT infrastructure and both of those have direct costs. So this is by no means a you know uh, a, an ideal solution. So a core capability of uh, of Jenkins um, is that you can offload the actual um, build and test activities off the main server onto. Um, dedicated, what we now call agent um, or node uh, nodes, um, that will actually run the builds and they will communicate with the master, you know, tell them yes it's worked or no it's not, and, and, and so on. When you have these isolated teams, um, each will have their own set of um, agent machines um, to, to run their jobs. And each team will want to make sure that they have sufficient resources allocated um, to these agents to handle their peak loads. Um, they don't want to wait for jobs or have jobs queue in because there isn't resource available. So each team caters for the peak load. They are typically, historically, will have been physical machines. Um, you know, that has changed a bit in the last few years. There, there, there may be sort of, you know, alternatives now. But typically, a lot of fixed machines that for a large part of the time are sitting idle. Um, so again, there is a real cost associated with that. So at least a very poor infrastructure utilization, a lot of duplication. 
So if we look at um, really what is then needed to, um, to scale um, Jenkins, well, to start with, it's, um, it's open source. Um, so you're going to need to consider sort of underpinning that with some sort of you know, technical knowledge uh, and expertise. But even with that in place, um, then there are these additional requirements that I've already alluded to. So security and compliance becomes much more important. You've got more users using the system. You need to know what they're doing. You, know, you need to be able to restrict them to, to access, access certain parts of the, the system. Um, and even if they can access it, you might want to limit what they can do once they've accessed it. So that becomes sort of a key requirement. The ability to scale um, you know, requires more more focus and, and resources, um, things like high availability and uh, resiliency become more and more critical. Um, and you know, we shouldn't also forget disaster recovery. Um, and certainly where you've got lots of disparate machines uh, or disparate Jenkins servers around the place, you know, just keeping on top of that aspect, you know, are they being backed up properly? Are the backups being tested? Um, you know, that, that becomes a, a major, major task in its own right. And of course, as, as you ha sort of have this increased activity uh, and operational efforts, then the need to manage um, the overall systems and gain visibility and control of operations becomes critical. Um, but if you can put all that lot in place, then uh, you are you know, giving yourself a good um, foundation um, from a, a system point of view to be able to scale successfully and you know, um, underpin these sort of DevOps transformations that are, that are happening today. So I'll start to talk now, and now a bit more about um, CGE. Um, I'll start off by talking uh, about what we call distributed pipeline architecture, um, or again, I'll abbreviate to DPA. So as mentioned, the main driver for CD is, is typically time to market. So the ability for teams to you know, progress quickly and efficiently through their pipelines is absolutely key. And when the first team creates their pipeline, in their own environment, that's what they get. You know, they are the masters of their own destiny. Um, they, they, they can have the speed, they can control their own stability, and at the end of the day, if something does go wrong, the business risk is low because it's only sort of impacting them. But as more and more teams um, you know, come on board, um, you know, creating their pipelines, running the pipelines, then problems start to arise. You, you, you get the monolithic server scenario. Uh, just the sheer sort of um, overloading of the server causes performance problems. That causes pipelines to slow down. Um, but there's also the complexities around you know, conflicting requirements between different teams to manage. And uh, as mentioned before, critically, Jenkins in this sort of scenario becomes a single point of failure. So not only does the performance decrease, but business risk increases significantly um, because one team can you know, uh, very adversely affect another team. So with the DPA, um, we address these issues um, by ensuring that teams run their pipelines in, in isolation from each other um, using dedicated uh, containerized services. So the speed of delivery is maintained, or it's even increased because we also provide you know, an element of sharing and best practice between the different teams where it's appropriate. Um, but in terms of their you know, core running the pipeline operation, they are isolated from the impact of, of any other teams. So that mitigates um, business risk as well. You know, it's almost back to the uh, to, to the initial slide. Uh, sorry, the initial team that they only impact themselves because if something goes wrong with their environment, you know, they're they're isolated. And exactly the same applies here. And also critically is that uh, we're removing those single points of failure. Um, so it. Uh, it becomes a much more, much more robust and stable uh, platform. But critical to this is that organize, organizations still get the benefit of, sort of cross-team management capabilities that CG provides. Um, without that, it wouldn't work. So looking at some of the key areas, um, that the scalability um, within CG, basically you can grow, uh, you know, add in any number of teams and you can grow those teams to whatever size. Uh, obviously subject to 
the underlying platforms uh, resources and capabilities but certainly if you're delivering into AWS then uh, Amazon will quite happily keep throwing resources in your your direction um, but it also does enable you to you know maximize the efficiency of your infrastructure so you minimize the actual hardware requirements um, by using sort of this elastic masters and build agents and I'll, I'll touch a lot more about that um, in a while Um, in terms of the high availability and resiliency, then CG basically provides a self-healing capability. So from its own internal monitoring, if it detects that the master has become unhealthy or if it's gone, you know, gone down, it will recover uh, that automatically. Um, and jobs that have been running, you know, pipelines that have been running against that failed master, they will continue independently. And when the new master comes up, um, they will reconnect and carry on. So particularly when you're looking at the, the, the CD side of things, you know, you're not necessarily talking about you know, five-minute compilations or you know, half an hour unit testing or something anymore. You might be talking about stages in your pipeline that take many hours or, or even days. And you don't want those to be impacted by you know, something untoward happening on the master. Um, so CG provides a way of sort of mitigating against those sort of um, issues. And in terms of management, um, CG is in effect providing an out-of-the-box solution that can be quickly deployed um, uh, to provide a sort of a Jenkins as a service um, solution. It dramatically simplifies the tasks of provisioning um, masters, additional masters and, and agents, uh, which enables rapid onboarding of, of new teams or um, spinning up um, servers for test purposes. And uh, I'll show shortly, you know, how this really goes way beyond, you know, the, the use of um, third-party provisioning tools to to create, you know, new um, standalone masters, um, because these are tightly integrated into the um, whole CG ecosystem. And I've talked about security and compliance. Um, CloudBees provide a uh, a very sort of rich role-based access control mechanism um, that allows you to make sure that teams um, only have access to what they should have uh, and then you know can only do uh, what they're allowed to do so you might have used have access to something but in a read-only capacity whereas other, others are able to to modify and then certainly with um, credentials um, the ability to to store in effect encrypted uh, credentials in, in vaults um, we provide flexibility as to how that can be achieved and I'll show that when I come to the demonstration So let's start looking at the CG um, architecture. Um, uh, but before going to that slide, just to re-emphasize you know, that scaling is not just about throwing more hardware or more IT resources uh, at the problem. Um, it, it, it needs to be robust, and it needs these additional areas of functionality to make it you know, secure, uh, maintainable, um, and so on. So I won't dwell too long on this uh, this slide. Um, just wanted to point out a few few important uh, items. And the first of these is um, the over on the right hand side here. We see the Jenkins project. Um, it's important to note that we do not modify the core Jenkins um, you know uh, product in any way. We take the open source distribution and we add to it. Um, we do that um, primarily through the use of you know customized um, plugins. In terms of um, uh, scaling, say one of the major. If you talk to any Jenkins administrator, uh, one of their major, you know, headaches is plugin management. And so we provide two, uh, two, two distinct areas that help um, in that in that respect. Um, the central one, uh, the verified open source plugins, it's an in initiative that uh, CloudBees started probably about six months ago. We call it our CloudBees Assurance Program. And what we're doing is, is identifying the, um, the most common uh, and core open source plugins. And we're battle testing those um, uh, before we include them into our, our distribution. And we don't just test the individual plugin, we test the plugin 
or specific versions of that plugin against specific versions of other plugins to to make sure that you know we've got that sort of compatibility between versions and the same with versions of Jenkins with the Jenkins core so we test the plugins against different versions of Jenkins core so we come up with this what we call this envelope that is a um, a collection of open source plugins at the moment I think it's around 40 and the aim is to grow that to about 100 within the year um, that uh, we can deliver to our customers and say look you don't need to worry about this as much as you have in the past because we've we've put in the effort and it's significant effort um, to verify that these work successfully and they work successfully together and we can enforce within the product to um, stop you entering uh, or installing a plugin that is part of the envelope that is not the required version or you could even go as far as getting it to automatically upgrade or downgrade plugins to to bring them in line so that is a key as as, as organizations grow and their Jenkins grow um, this sort of functionality is um, you know is extremely useful in in trying to minimize the risks of um, upgrading uh, and introducing problems because of bad plugins um, the other aspect relating to plugins is the update center so within CGE you have the ability to create what we call cu custom update centers so this allows you to to have a much sort of greater control um, of the flow of plugins um, coming into the organization and then being deployed onto your production server or production servers um, so it could just be used as a, as a proxy to uh, the external CloudBees update center um, but you can also chain them so uh, chain update centers so you can create a workflow that will allow you to sort of bring plugins in um, uh, carry out some tests on you know, some test masters um, and decide you know when you're ready to to put them into production or they could also be used um, to handle a situation where you have different teams that have different plugin requirements um, so the combination of the update centers and the verified OSS plugins goes sort of a, a great way to removing a lot of the headache and pain that administrators um, you know, have when using the open source solution I won't talk about the the other aspects on on this slide um, now because we'll we'll sort of look at things in a in a slightly different way. So at this high level, um, this is this could be viewed as a typical um, CGE um, deployment in, in terms of the different uh, different components. So you'll see straight away that it's got multiple masters. Um, notionally supporting different teams wouldn't necessarily need to be broken down in that way but it makes sense um, you know if you've got a, got a got a team give them a dedicated master but you also have this Jenkins operation center um, again the abbreviation I may use is CJOC uh, and this provides a single pane of glass dashboard and, and management capabilities over your entire environment So the dashboards uh, that it provides, they encapsulate the data from all of the, the, the different masters, and that provides data related to builds, you know, build times, queue times, and so on, um, as well as system performance. And it enables cross-team comparisons, which can help to highlight areas of best practice, or conversely, areas and teams that may require um, additional assistance. So the operation center also hosts this pool of shared build agents. You can see over on the top, top right of the slide. So rather than having um, you know, significant resource associated with each of the, the masters, the agents can be shared um, via the operation center. So when a, a master uh, runs a job and it needs an agent, um, the, the build agent will be temporarily in effect, leased, made available to the master. When the job is finished, the resource will go back into the, um, into the pool. There may be requirements for some masters to have their dedicated build nodes. We can see down for project team one. Um, it might be that they, you know, run run builds or tests on some specific hardware that no other team is, you know, is, is involved with. So the capability still uh, sort of exists to do that. That. And then on the sort of the to the left of the operation center, we have the um, RBAC um, and LDAP box there. So rather than having the overhead of implementing authentication on, on each master as you would need to in, in the open source um, uh, world 
this is now controlled via the operation center. So it provides a single sign-on capability um, and transparently um, to users of individual masters will be authenticating them via the operation center, typically you know, using LDAP or Active Directory or, or some similar um, sort of access management solution. Once a user is authenticated, that is basically saying, you know, user Fred is now allowed to access this particular master. The role-based access control, that then ties down and defines what that user is going to be able to do. And again, we'll see that in a little bit later on. Uh, and then the final point on this slide is the update center. So um, up in the top left there, um, this shows an update center that is, has got an upstream source of, in this case, the open source uh, update center. Um, and uh, the, the operation center will then control the publication of, of um, plugins that have come in to the custom update center through to the, uh, the masters below. So an alternative um, view of the infrastructure. It's represented slightly differently, but you can see um, a relationship with the previous diagram in that we have the operation center component, we've got a number of Jenkins masters, and we've got a pool of Jenkins agents for running your jobs and pipelines. But there are also some additional elements to this uh, diagram, um, in particular looking at the resource management tier and the control tier uh, and storage element. So irrespective of whether you're develop, uh, deploying to AWS or OpenStack or VMware or even bare metal, um, CJE is, is implemented as a cluster of components to which a large extent it's, it's a black box um, that is managed by the software that, um, that we provide and you don't really need to know too much about what's going on inside it. Um, and once the cluster is installed, it's um, pretty transparent as to whether it's deployed onto AWS or um, bare metal. The, the actual so the, the cluster itself and the management of that um, is virtually the same um, in all scenarios. So if you're familiar with Docker at all, then you will probably have spotted the logo um, in each of the master and agent box and the operation centers that gives the game away a bit that CGA, CJE is using Docker extensively as part of um, CJ cluster. So the operation center runs uh, within a Docker container, as do each of the individual masters, uh, and as do the, uh, the agents. So this provides the team isolation benefits that we talked about earlier, uh, as well as self-healing self capabilities. So if a master becomes um, unhealthy, the control processes will detect that and automatically spin up a replacement. Uh, and as mentioned before, the running pipelines will then reconnect to that replacement master. Now, in terms of agents, um, in effect, the cluster provides a pool of resources to be used for running jobs, but the agents are federal. And by that, I mean that they don't exist until they're required by a job, at which point a Docker uh, container is created, it runs the job, and at completion, the Docker, Docker container is shut down, freeing that resource back to the pool. So this makes for a highly efficient use of, of your you know, compute resources, minimizing the sort of overall resource that you would need to you know, allocate um, uh, or be provisioned for the pool. And if you consider that with the earlier scenario where sort of each team would need to have sufficient agent resources, likely to be physical machines, then uh, you're you know, in a completely different um, ballpark. And with the aim of providing Jenkins as a service, um, uh, once the cluster has been provisioned, and it would be typically some sort of shared services team that would be doing that, then it becomes a simple, um, quick task to onboard a new team. In effect, um, from a technical point of view, it's spinning up a new Docker container. Um, but it also ensures that that new container, the master that's running in that container, has all the connectivity it needs to the operation center, the ability to create these um, uh, agents on demand, um, and so on. So with this approach, say we call the distributed pipeline architecture, it encourages the horizontal scalability um, of a solution. So with a larger number of smaller masters that are easier to manage, um, but all under the you know, control of the, the operation center. So if you've got a new team coming on board, once their master is provisioned, 
which is probably going to take about a minute to achieve, something, something in that order. Um, if required, then uh, administrative, administrative rights can be delegated down to the team. So you may have a team leader or something. Uh, so rather than shared services having to um, you know, continually carry out sort of tasks, adding new users, setting up permissions and so on, that can be delegated um, down. So that all helps with the flow and the speed. Um, you know, you're, you're removing you know, human bottlenecks as well as some of the technical bottlenecks that we've, uh, we've seen. So final architecture slide, which again is a slightly, again, a different representation, um, but it's showing some different information. So if we look at um, the, uh, the central cluster element, you can see that there are a number of what we call workers. There are four workers, and each worker is a virtual machine. So um, on AWS, it will be an EC2 instance. And in this case, we've got two uh, workers allocated for masters, and we've got two uh, work, uh, sorry, VMs allocated for agents. So those numbers are arbitrary, and they would totally depend on your overall scaling and size. Um, and clearly, they can change over time. So you know, if you find that you you're, you you need more resource, well, you can just allocate another VM into the cluster, and uh, CG will start using it. And the Docker orchestration side of things is handled automatically. So I said that it's more or less a black box. So when a job is triggered, um, uh, the job will have a label, in, in you know the same sense that they always have in the past. Um, that label will identify what type of Docker image can be used to run that job. And uh, that container will then be provisioned onto one of the agent workers. And the decision as to which you know, virtual machine is used is totally transparent. Um, you know, as a user, even as a, a CG administrator, you don't need to know. Um, you know. The Docker orchestration side of things will take care of that based on the sp spare capacity and so on that uh, exists on the different um, workers. And in these diagrams, you can see the spare capacity is shown by the uh, open slot um, boxes. So uh, in this case, there's not too many open slots left on the agent workers. Maybe it's time to add another virtual machine into the cluster to you know, add that additional um, uh, capacity. And you know, conversely, if you find that um, you know, you're, you're hitting quiet spells, then uh, the agent workers could be taken out of the, uh, the cluster, um, you know, so that you can sort of maximize that sort of efficiency. So when I come to the demonstration, then we'll, we'll see that we can have different types of Docker templates. So you might have one team that's developing in Java, you might have another team that's developing in Go, um, you might have you know, teams using different test tools. So you don't want to have software on your agents that is not being used, um, which often happens in you know traditional agent um, senses. Or you might have a product that needs to be tested against using Java 7 and Java 8. So if you're using a physical machine as your agent, the likelihood is you're, you're probably not going to want to have two boxes um, you know, running, running different versions. So you'll put the same software onto both boxes. And that you know, potentially um, can arise, uh, lead to complications. Um, you, know, you, you might ac accidentally sort of pollute one or the other. Um, so this environment gives you a very clean way of isolating um, Docker containers that only require the software that is needed, nothing more, and that can run in isolation. Uh, I'm aware that time is, is moving on a bit, so I'll, um, I'll sort of uh, speed up slightly. Um, oh, actually, no, but the one, one last thing I'll mention on here is that as, as well as these clusters, uh, these sort of uh, workers that are being used to run the operation center and masters and agents. We also have these controller processes um, that are shown off to the left-hand side. And uh, they do things like they route traffic from the outside world. So all, all traffic coming into the, uh, into the cluster comes via a load balancer uh, and will be routed to the appropriate place. And if you, you know, bear in mind that I've said, well, if a master dies for some reason or a complete virtual machine dies, then uh, the application scheduler will arrange for a replacement 
um, Docker container to be spun up wherever the resource is available. So in effect, it could be on a different machine. And if a virtual, if one of the VMs dies, then clearly it would be on a different machine. So its IP address will have changed and so on. But all that is handled by the control processes. It's not something that, you know, from a, a, a CG um, or a, a user's perspective that you need to worry about. And the diagram shows there are three, um, three controllers there. Uh, so again, just the mechanism that used, it needs to be an odd number. And uh, as we'll see in a moment, that, um, that ability to have multiple controllers can provide resiliency to the overall cluster itself. So as well as the masters and, and so on um, being handled as Docker containers and replaced if they become unhealthy, the controller itself has resiliency built in. Um, this is just a slide from our conference last year, uh, um, Jenkins World, uh, where they did a live demonstration of CG on AWS, um, showing that it spun up uh, 2,000 masters and about 8,000 concurrent agents. So um, that should be the uh, sufficient for most organizations. And uh, that wasn't a sort of a technical limit that was reached. It was just felt that that was a, an appropriate cutoff point. So the, the, the last slide before having a, a quick look at the product um, is just a sample um, you know, deployment. I know the text is fairly um, small, um, but uh, it's just sort of showing uh, a deployment into, um, on AWS with the three availability zones. So uh, we spread the controllers and the, the master workers and the build workers across those zones. So although it's um, maybe not a common occurrence, but uh, it's not unheard of for Amazon to have a, um, a zone outage. Um, and this sort of uh, suggested infrastructure here would, would enable uh, you know, the CG cluster to survive that, um, that outage. OK, so I'll, I'll now go into um, demonstration mode. Bear with me a second. Okay, so you can see my screen there. So uh, this is um, the uh, operation center. Um, if you're familiar with Jenkins, uh, you will think, well, this looks very sim similar to Jenkins. And in effect, it is, it is Jenkins. So the operation center, although it has this sort of very important role of managing all these other resources, it is actually Jenkins itself. It's just it's customized by some uh, you know, proprietary plugins that, that CloudBees um, have developed. So the look and feel uh, should be common um, or familiar to you. So if we look at um, uh, what's showing there, I'm, I'm showing a cluster um, that's got currently three masters uh, running on it. Um, two, I've notionally, are related to sort of front-end development, uh, one for mobile, one for web, and the other relating to you know, back-end you know, server, um, server development. And while it's not essential to do so um, here. I, I've actually put the full uh, the uh, servers into a folder, and so if I was to go to the front end folder, for example, then you can see my two masters are sitting um, within there. And the reason for doing that, or one of the, one of the reasons for doing that, is is that it makes it very easy to apply certain um, roles or credentials and so on at the folder level that will then be automatically inherited by any of the masters and folders beneath that, that point. So in this example, if I look at credentials, um, then I've got some credentials here that are scoped just to this folder. Um, so the, 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 this would allow jobs to be created on either of those masters that can use these um, credentials but elsewhere, on the other masters uh, and so on, they wouldn't be available. And uh, the same sort of applies to, um, to roles. So, so from a Jenkins perspective, um, yeah, we've got three servers there. Um, if I quickly look at um, Amazon, I'll refresh it, make sure it's up to date. 
then we can see we've actually got um, five EC2 instances um, that in effect are, are under, underpinning this, this current cluster. And uh, so I've got one controller node, say in production, you would always have three or, or more, um, has to be an odd number. And I've got um, uh, four other uh, virtual machines that are running workers. Now I can't tell from Amazon, it doesn't know whether they're for running masters or whether they're for running agents, um, but it's just showing what's sort of running, uh, running up there. So from a command line, um, I have a sort of command line interface. Um, I have what we call a bastion host, which is just in effect a machine that I've controlled the installation from, and I can sort of use command line operations onto the onto the cluster. And without sort of going into too much um, detail, uh, I'll just run a command that will, or if I could spell. I'll just run a command that will, um, in effect, list the different workers that are currently enabled on this server. And we can see here that worker two is, its purpose is to run masters, and uh, worker five is designed to run build agents, uh, and so on. And this shows, if you're familiar with AWS, the, this M4.x large, that identifies the type of VM and the, the, you know, the compute resources that are available to the, to the VM. So normally, as in, in terms of normal operation, you'd never need to go you know, near this on a day-to-day -day basis. You don't need to know and understand um, you know, what's happening there. So if I go back to um, the operation center, then uh, I've talked a bit about credentials. So at, at a, a global level, at the operation center level, I have a number of different uh, credentials defined. So there are things like you know, access to my GitHub account or to my Docker Hub account or for interface into HipChat and, uh, and so on. So these credentials from the operation center will be available to you know, any of the masters on the server. So this is where you would put the global, global credentials. Um, but uh, by the use of um, the CloudBees Folders Plus plugin, it also allows you to do what I was saying before is sit down within that front end um, folder to define credentials that are then only available to the jobs that are um, you know, beneath that, uh, that, that point in the tree. So in effect, you can set up team-specific credentials. This is the roles. So this is associated with the RBAC, the role-based access control. So, roles are defined at the operation center level. Um, these are they're arbitrary by name. Um, you can create as many roles as you want, and for any particular role, you would then select which you know, specific permissions that role should have. So, in effect, in this in this case, this saying, well, we've got a role called develop, and the the check box is over to the right. That is saying, this is if if somebody is a developer. These are the capabilities, the things that we expect them to be able to do. So, for example, um, build a job, you know, create a job, and so on. So, at this at this stage, it's not actually applying those rules to anybody. It's just saying, if you are a developer, this is what we expect you to be able to do. If you're a browser, so read only, then um, you know you've got a more restricted set of permissions. So that's defined at the operation center level, and those roles then become available to you know, all of the, uh, the masters. And you can decide then on a team-by-team -team basis, or um, even a folder, folder basis, or even an individual job basis to say, you know, I want somebody with um, you know, develop permission to have access to this, this particular folder. So you can grant permissions in that way. And I'll show that briefly in a moment. So in terms of authentication, um, again, typically um, in a scenario where you, you've deployed many masters, open source masters, you have to set up authentication on, on, in, on each and every one of them. Um, within the CG environment, it's all handled from the, um, uh, the operation center. So you would typically be you know, integrating with LDAP or 
or other pl ever, ever plugins. For the purpose of the demonstration, um, I've got something that makes it look like uh, an LDAP source where I can just create users and groups in here. It just makes it much easier to manage from a, a demonstration point of view. So if I look at these um, these different servers uh, here, say so I've, I've created um, um, some different groups. So, sorry, I've gone in the wrong place. So if I was to, I've, I've got the users um, uh, called uh, um, dev server, um, dev web, and dev mobile. So developers for server, developer for mobile, developer for web. So I'll go across to a different browser just because of cookies and so on, so I can log in at the same time. And if I uh, so log in there, oh, sorry. Uh, I'll log in as dev server. I'm not sure I got that URL right, so let me just double check before I. I oh, know that's okay. Um, then you can see I've, I've now logged in as, as as this user or any user that belongs to that group, and I can only see the back end server. I can't see the front end ones. If I log out of there though, and uh, this time I'll log in as dev web then now I can see both front-end servers I can't see the back-end server but I'm currently logged in as dev web so my prime purpose in life uh, a developer as part of this group is to work on the, uh, the, the web infrastructure the web uh, projects so if I go into that master you can see that I have got um, permission to create whereas if I go into the mobile master, I can see things, but I no longer have the ability to create. So using our back, we're able to sort of, you know, implement that sort of fine-grained um, granularity to, um, you know, impose those, those sort of rules. So I won't go into the full detail of how it's, uh, how I've done it, but um, here within the mobile group, um, I've said there's a group called Mobile Developers, and Dev Mobile is a member of that group. And if I look at that that particular uh, group, you can see the permissions that it's got um, includes all these create and so on. So we've associated a role with that particular um, that group. So within the mobile master, that gives in effect right permissions to. Um, dev mobile but at the higher level the groups that are created there front-end users they only have read permission so that's why the user dev web only had read permission in the um, mobile master but has write permission in um, the webmaster hopefully that's not too confusing but uh, in terms of how it's done but Hopefully you, you get the uh, the principle. And say we could also add credentials within either the folder or to a, t a particular master to tie down what that user can can do. So we say one of the things about scaling is you want speed. You want to say, well, I've got a new team coming on board. Um, you know, gone are the days when I need to submit that ticket to get the uh, the new virtual machine uh, to run my master, and I have to wait sort of uh, you know a day, a week, a month that virtual machine to be be provisioned um, we put in the request and um, uh, we can sort of get going pretty quickly so I'll, I'll say that that's happened the shared services team they've got a requirement um, to add uh, a new team that's developing API software and we select uh, what we call a managed master so that is one of these masters that is running as part of the cluster and it's been managed directly by the operations center. So if I hit OK, then it allows me some you know, configuration options. Um, one of the key ones is a Docker image. So whenever CloudBees now um, produce a release of software, um, as well as the normal sort of uh, you know WAR file. Available then to use when creating these managed masters. But you can also create your custom 
um, customized masters and that's what I'm, I'll use now and while it's doing it I'll, I'll explain why. Um, so you could also use this for upgrading. So as new releases become available, they can be put into the configuration so they appear in this list. And uh, you, you sort of have a choice. So you might have a different master for different teams. Um, one of the things that this B demo image does is we have pre-baked certain plugins into the image. Um, so if you've got different teams that have different requirements, then you could look at taking that sort of approach. Um, uh, we sort of allocate sort of default resources to, uh, in effect, what will become the Docker container running this master. But um, if you know that you know one team is is much heavier duty than another, then you could you could uh, sort of amend these as required. So I won't bother with any other things for now. I'll just press uh, um, save, and this is now provisioning my master for me. And uh, I'll go to a web-based interface that we, we have that um, allows you to look at some you know, aspects of the cluster. And we can see that um, it's currently provisioning a master called API in, in the front end. So this is sort of uh, looking at it from a sort of a, a Docker, um, Docker perspective. So let's say it takes about a minute um, probably for it to, um, to come up. Um, you can see it there already. It's just not not quite um, connected yet. And I can even look at that um, down from the command line if I so wish. I can sort of log into those containers and uh, into the workers and see those containers um, running. I suspect it's got there. It's probably just hasn't quite refreshed as yet. Okay, so it's up and running. It, it's alive. Um, so all of the authentication for now using that server and so on is already in place. That's great. And uh, if I want to, say I now might delegate responsibility for, um, for handling this master away from the shared services team down to um, sort of a, a team leader. So I'll call it API team team lead I'm going to say I want that person or that that in effect that group to have administrative privileges and and I want to add a user or a group um, to that so I have a user called Fred so Fred now has administrative rights on that new server he doesn't have administrative rights at the CJOC level or the other masters, um, but if I go across to my other browser uh, and say my, oops, sorry, I'm fiddling with the uh, the mouse. Doesn't want to play ball. What did I do wrong there? Ah, dot. Okay, so I log in as Fred. And um, I'm now into my new new master and we can see I've got managed Jenkins privileges. So as Fred he can now go on and you know handle some of the other configurations. So I mentioned Blue Ocean earlier. Actually, no, before I go into Blue Ocean, um, these agent templates. So I've said when you run a job, it will look to find the appropriate agent um, to use. And these are just templates. So these are standard ones that we provide. You can add your own. You can create your own um, custom templates that have the software that you need to do your builds or to do your testing and so on. So um, there are some sort of vanilla Docker um, agents there and we can see we've got um, you know two different variants of um, uh, Java uh, so if we want a job to run to be tested with JDK 7 fine it'll use that the, that container otherwise it'll, it will use that one so if I go into Blue Ocean just to show you briefly this uh, new interface then it, it's very much geared around pipelines so for the, the, the full CIDC side of things, 
um, and it integrates you know closely with your um, SCM system. So I'm saying I've got source um, within GitHub. I'll just have to uh, grab a, a credential token to access uh, my repos, and I'll say I'll use this one. I want to create a new pipeline, and I want to create it for a project I call No Jenkins File. Now, Jenkins File is is how you can code your pipeline. Um, using either sort of groovy DSL or as I mentioned in the slides earlier there's one of the things that um, Cloudbees delivered or, or helped deliver to the open source community was declarative pipeline um, so that script can be stored in a file in your repository and if it's if it exists it can be used um, in effect to build your pipeline within Jenkins so I'm deliberately pointing this at a repo that doesn't have a Jenkins file so there's no pipeline created uh, it, it, doesn't exist this is a brand new project uh, we've put this we've got the source code in our git repo um, but we haven't yet created a pipeline for it so blue ocean gives me a, um, a pipeline editor um, that I can use to build it up and I'll, I'll just do so very quickly so I'll say build and I won't put anything real in there I mean typically here you might run a maven um, step or something I'll just put a message in to say that I'm building um, once we've built, we then want to do some testing. So, and I want to um, do some test with Chrome, but I also want to do some um, test with uh, Firefox. And perfect Firefox. I didn't uh, okay so Chrome and because those tests are going to work perfectly first time I'm now going to add a deploy step so again this might be publishing a docker image up to a <coughs> docker registry it might be pushing something into artifactory or whatever so we'll just say it's deploying and so there's my there's my a pipeline. Um, if I save it, it's uh, going to publish this back into my um, repository. Uh, so I'll say pipeline framework, save it, and if I were to go back to um, my git repo, and look at no Jenkins file it has now got a Jenkins file it was created 15 seconds ago so blue ocean created the file and pushed it and, and this is the code it's generated and you can see it ties in with what I was doing we've got a, a pipeline we can say it can run on any agent because I don't need any particular software at the moment um, and I'm doing the build the test and the deploy so that's part of looking at the sort of the, the de-skilling um, is that you know just just to create that initial um, pipeline template is very very straightforward you don't need any particular skills you might need to have some particular knowledge if you, you know, start looking at um, you know the details of what you need to do in, in each of these steps um, using Maven and so on but to create the framework is sort of very very straightforward and you know once you've created it you can still edit it um, in here now so we could say yeah let's also do edge and and that will you know again round, round loop it it will then save that back to the um, uh, back to the repository if you're in the lucky stay a uh, situation where you've already got some Jenkins files um, because if you've been using open source Jenkins or something then you may already have have them um, or another team has developed things then you're sort of migrating it into your environment then you can make, make use of those so if I say well I want to create a new pipeline again again it's in github um, it's in a particular repo called go demo so I'm gonna say create and while it's doing that um, I'll just sit back to github and <clears throat> search here we can see that that git repository 
Um, and it's got a Jenkins file in there um, that was created a month ago. And if we look at it again, it is this sort of pipeline code. And uh, don't worry about the detail of exactly what it's doing. This is sort of um, uh, doing things. It's actually creating Docker containers that it will be then pushed to Docker Hub at the end. So it's sort of quite advanced. Um, uh, but the principle is that this code, is this declarative pipeline code, is in your SCM system alongside the application code and uh, it is being used to dynamically create um, the pipeline for you. Now this will take a good few minutes to run so I won't necessarily you know, see that through but I just wanted to sort of show it as a, as a principle. So in effect you know, with, with very little time there we've created a, a new master, we've delegated authority, administrative rights to a user um, and then we're sort of instantly able to start um, running um, uh, pipelines that are using this dynamic pool of, um, of Docker agents. Um, I'll just show that one last thing before going back to the slides. So if I was to say um, uh, list workers, so without, without going elsewhere, I don't know for definite which build agent this job is currently running on, but we'll, we'll try worker worker five to start with. So I'm now logged on to the virtual machine in the cluster up in AWS. Um, and from there, I can look and see, well, what processes are running. And yeah, I can see, so it's running this Docker image called BDemo, um, DIN Compose Agent. Um, so it's pulled up down from Docker Hub uh, and is now running, um, running my job within that agent in that sort of overall pool of, of um, agent resources. So I appreciate I'm well and truly over, over my time, uh, my hour. So um, I'll just flip back to, uh, to the slides and say, so, you know, scalability, there are two distinct, you know, very distinct aspects to it. Uh, you know, the one is the, the IT infrastructure and we're, basically supporting that by the use of this sort of dynamic and elastic you know, dockerized solution that can quickly scale and self-healing and so on. Um, but there's also the functionality you need. There's no, there's no point in being able to spin up lots and lots of uh, masters, whether they're in Docker or, or otherwise, if you're not able to, to sensibly manage those and handle the authentication and security um, you know, that's required by enterprises. So, say so I'm uh, a little bit later than um, intended, but I'm still available. Um, you know, if anybody has any questions, I'll try to answer them. If I can't answer them, I can take them away. Um, and as I said earlier, if um, if you need to, my contact details uh, are up there on the, the slide. So please do feel free to send me um, you know any questions that you have uh, after the event. Great, thanks Adrian. So we'll, just, we'll just have a couple of moments now just to see if any questions come through um, and then okay. we'll just see. Bear with me one moment. Okay, we have got one question, Adrian, that has come through. If you can have a look at that. Okay, so I think I think the question is is what is whether um, in effect that CloudBees Jenkins Enterprise is using any different declarative syntax to the open source implementations. I think that's what the question is asking. Um, in which case we don't. Um, the declarative syntax is, is exactly um, you know, the same as in uh, the open source distribution. Um, it is 
continually being developed. So that, that it's one of the projects that was handled by you know Cloudbees um, uh, engineers, and uh, I think it's um, say it was initially released in February, um, and you know there are changes and enhancements you know being made to it uh, over time, but it will be the same syntax whether you're within CJE or an open source distribution. Great, thank you very much Adrian. I think that's all for questions at this time, but obviously you have put your email address down there, so we will be sending out the um, recording, so if anyone does have any further questions, um, it will contain your email address and they can reach out directly. So thank you very much for today. Okay, thank you and goodbye.